Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, today, what I wanted to do is we, we had just finished up, uh, let me go back to the other slides here. We just finished up talking about what it takes to be successful in this class and in the degree itself. And some of that is uh, essentially work ethic, uh, focus. Some of it is gonna be passion for the stuff that we're talking about. And uh, I promise you that being able to do this stuff is very uh, fun, it's very interesting, but sometimes it can be challenging, sometimes it can be frustrating, uh, a lot like anything else worth, worth doing. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to start at the beginning uh, in this class. Again, uh, I mentioned earlier, you don't have to have any pre-existing knowledge. Uh, you don't have to know anything about programming. You don't have to be a super uh, duper programmer or have programmed anything before to be successful in this. We're going to start from the beginning uh, and work our way through. So starting here, uh, what we're going to do uh, first off is, oops, is we're going to look at uh, what it means to do game programming, which is really what this class is about. Uh, this class is a game programming class and we're going to start off with some simple concepts here as what is a computer and how does it work? And surprisingly, even people that are uh, programmers and people who have computer science degrees don't really understand how the computer works at a fundamental level. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start off with that. We're going to start off with this, like, what is it? How does it work? How does it do what it does? And because there's a, the reason we're going to do that is there's a tendency to think of the computer as this really like magical device. It allows you to do magical things, but the way it works is incredibly simple, incredibly easy to understand. And you'll go into this in further depth later on in your degree. But for right now, I just want to give you kind of an overview of what it is. How does it work? It's not some black magic contraption, although there's a tendency to think of it that way. So that's what we're going to do. How to, and because it, or if we understand how it works and how it does what it does and what it is, the parts of it, then that's going to help us be better programmers in the long run. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, kind of switch over here. I'm going to switch over to this piece of paper, and I'm just going to write notes kind of manually on here. Hopefully you can kind of see that the frame rate isn't great on this camera because the light in this room isn't great, but and it's not a good camera uh, either. But we're going to go through and start off with what is a computer and how does it work? All right, so a good starting point for that is if you uh, have friends that are like computer nerds or you're yourself is what we call a computer nerd, then they always talk about their machine that they're building or that they built or their gaming setup or their gaming rig. And there's always this uh, talk about the different components of it that make it up. And so we're going to spend just a little time talking about that and then look at how they all interrelate with each other. So you might say, have this friend or you yourself may have bought a new computer system, a new gaming setup, and you might uh, say, well, it's got this processor and this much memory and these peripherals and this graphics card. And so I'm just going to start off by making kind of a list of those. So I'm going to call this parts of a computer. And those parts of a computer, I'm just going to put a list here uh, of those. So I mentioned a couple things when I was talking about that. The first one we might put on here would be something like the processor, CPU, which I'm going to put in parentheses there would be the processor. And so that would be one component of it. But then you might also, they might talk about the amount of memory. So uh, I'll just put memory here. In most cases, when people are talking about their memory, how much of it is there, what type of it is, how fast is it. But I'm going to say this is kind of like RAM. But there are other kinds of memory in the computer as well, but we're going to just talk about that. So kind of memory. And then they might talk about, well, I got this like really cool like gaming mouse. Uh, I got this really cool gaming keyboard. Uh, maybe a graphics card. So... We'll call that like the GPU, which I'm going to put in parentheses here is like the graphics card. And there are maybe some other things we could add to this list as well, maybe like the power supply, maybe the case, maybe the kind of monitor. 
And obviously that we could add some more things to that list as well, like uh, like a hard drive. Network cards, things like that. But that list there is probably a good, pretty good list to get us started. So the idea here with those being the parts of that uh, computer system is that um, the computers uh, are really one of the great inventions uh, that they're, they're defining inventions in the history of humanity that have completely changed society and completely changed the world uh, as far as the way humans interact with it. And a computer is, uh, is certainly one of those and arguably one of the ones that would be at the top of the list of things that have changed the world around us. So other things that would be on that list uh, maybe you would think of would be uh, like the internal combustion engine. Uh, would certainly be one of those. Um, there are other ones as well that you could add, like the plow would be a, a really important invention for humanity's history, or the wheel, uh, the internal combustion engine. Uh, you could probably add refrigeration to that list. There's a whole bunch of uh, the telephone, the television, uh, all of those things like that, uh, radio, all of those things are inventions that transformed the world uh, and society entirely. And th those uh, airplane uh, would probably be on the list. So the ability to have manned flight uh, is one of those. So all of those inventions like that, the computer amongst those uh, is clearly on that list of top inventions that have changed uh, the world and changed the world around us. And so if we look at that list of parts though, like most great inventions, one of the things on this list had to have come first. So somebody had to have created part of this and then had this idea that was sparked by that that allowed them to then think, oh, we could create uh, this amazing thing uh, because the, one of these things sparked this idea that led to another idea that led to another one. So the first thing I want to do here is which one of these things do you think that was that was uh, created first? So what I want to do is I'm going to start eliminating some. Uh, we're going to take some off of there as what which thing here came first. So the first one we can probably take off of there is, uh, well, uh, let's, let's look at some of these. So let's start off with um, a mouse. Uh, was the mouse around and in existence? And somebody thought, you know what? I have this mouse, but I really need a computer to connect it to. And so I'm going to go ahead and invent a computer to connect this mouse to. And that's obviously uh, somewhat ridiculous. So we can probably X out mouse here and say, well, it wasn't that. That wasn't the first one. So it wasn't the mouse. Also the keyboard, the first computers that existed didn't have a keyboard. So we could probably take that off the list. So it wasn't the keyboard. Nobody had like a typewriter. I mean, keyboards and typewriters existed long before computers did, but it wasn't like somebody was typing and saying, if only there were a way to make... Uh, this thing compute things for me. Maybe people thought that, but that wasn't really what sparked the idea of computer systems. And evidence of that is the first computer systems didn't even have keyboards. That's not how they were uh, programmed or how people interacted with them. So let's go and X off keyboard there. So it wasn't that. Graphics card, it clearly wasn't that. Nobody created like this awesome NVIDIA graphics card many years ago and then said, now we need a computer to add to it. Uh, so we can take that one off the list. Now, we're down to a few things here. We've got like case, well, it's not like somebody made a computer case and said, oh, I need to invent a computer to stick into this box. So let's take that one off. Monitor, TVs were around, but nobody saw a TV and thought, if only there, I could put a computer uh, and connect to that. And good evidence of that is the earliest computers didn't have monitors either. So we're down to hard drive, power supply, memory, CPU. Hard drive doesn't make any sense because hard drives were a more recent invention that were invented for computers that already existed. So now we have power supply, memory, and CPU. And power supplies have been around for quite a while, but that didn't really spark the idea of a computer system. So now we're down to just two things that are left here, the CPU, the processor, and the memory. So the question is, which one of those two things came first? And how did that spark the idea of creating something like a, a CPU or a processor? And so the answer to this is, uh, if I gave you time to uh, guess, some of you might pick processor, some of you might pick memory. But the answer to this is it actually turns out that this 
is kind of the first uh, invention that led to the invention of the computer. So I'm going to go ahead and X out CPU. So this is kind of the thing that came first. And to give an idea of uh, how that came first and why, we have to kind of rewind uh, to a time period uh, somewhere about 110 years ago. And the, there was a, a man named uh, Herman Hollerith who was the founder of the company that would eventually become IBM. But essentially what uh, Hollerith did is he got a contract uh, to do the, I think it was the 1890 census, where before all of those numbers were tabulated by hand, where they'd take forms, they'd have people fill in the forms, and maybe some of you uh, or your parents did census forms recently, uh, or maybe you know somebody that filled out census forms, but the census asks questions about your, your household, how many people are in it, uh, what... Uh, at this address, how many people live there? Some of them have longer form ones that ask additional questions about what's the income level, what's the, uh, what are the genders of the people that live there, and what are their ages. And uh, But essentially, it's a lot of forms that get filled out with numbers on them. Well, previously, all of those had to be tabulated by hand, so they had rooms full of people just counting up how many people said male or female or how many people lived in this district versus this one and so it was a very labor intensive process with people just kind of making marks on papers just filling out paper after paper with these little hash marks and then counting them all up and then another person would have to verify they were correct well anyway the government wanted to make that uh, more efficient uh, and be able to do that more quickly and with less uh, effort so they basically contracted with uh, Herman Hollerith's company to come up with a way to calculate that. So he had created these uh, devices that could actually store numbers in the form of little electric switch settings. And he had the way where you could basically click and add a number to that. So you think of it kind of like uh, if you ever gone into a store and the people have those little handheld counters and they click the thing, click, click, click every time somebody comes in. So it has a count of how many people are inside. It was kind of a, a version of something like that. But the result here is what memory was. We can think of it as a device. Could be electromechanical, could be purely electronic as it is today. But we have this device that could store, think of it like a box, and that could store a number, have like the number zero in it. And you could click a thing, and it would go to a one. And you could click a thing, and it would go to a two. So you have this ability to do that. And for the census, since they needed uh, more than one thing that they had to keep track of, different uh, states, how many people are living in each state, how many people are in each district, how many of them are male, how many are female, how many own a home, how many don't, uh, how many, what's the average household size, how many are kids, how many are in this age group. You had to have a lot of different uh, things. So this is kind of one memory box, which I'm just going to call it a memory cell. Memory cell. So there's a memory cell. I'm writing a little bit too small there for the resolution of the camera, but that says memory. I don't know if I probably made it worse there. So here's this one memory cell. But the idea was we needed more than one memory cell. So what he ended up doing was creating, if you have one device that can store a number, let's make a bunch of them that can store different numbers. And then rather than having when those people t tabulate those census forms with hashtags, or, ha or not hashtags, but hash marks, and then counting them up and then doing that, let's just use this device to do that for us. So maybe this one would have zero in it, this one would have like 10, maybe another one would wind up with 104, or 23, or 65, or whatever. It's just these memory devices, a bank of them, that can each store different numbers. So maybe these ones are still at zero. But we have this group of, uh, devices that can each store some sort of number in that memory. Now, and this is kind of where the idea of a computer came from, is that the obvious next idea uh, for this, and let me go ahead and number this page so we can keep track of where we are. So that's page one. So now we have kind of this, what I'm going to say, this is a bank of memory devices. 
or a group of them. Let's just say group, group of memory devices. So now we have this group of memory devices. And the idea, the reason why this led to a computer system is along the way, somebody said, well, we have all of these devices storing numbers in them. What would be really cool is rather than a device that just stores numbers, what if I wanted to make a device that could do uh, mathematical operations on those devices too? Is it possible to do that? So the idea is like, let's say these are all different districts in a state. What if we want to add up the total rather than doing it by hand? Why don't I just get the machine to add up all of those for me? And so that's where the idea of the processor came from. The processor is just another kind of device that can connect to this kind of memory uh, bank or this group of memory devices and then pull numbers out and maybe perform some kind of operations on them. So that the invention of RAM led to the invention of this uh, processing device to do things with those numbers. So let me go ahead and go to the next page and let me, yeah, let me keep this one as the page because those tend to bleed through. Okay, so now we're on to the concept of a CPU and all the CPU is, uh, if you sit, let's redraw that kind of bank of memory devices here. So let's say here's a bank of memory devices that each have numbers in them and they can really only store numbers. Okay, so there's my bank of memory devices. I'm gonna go and label it. Memory. And the idea is I wanna have access to the numbers that are in here. So zero, I don't remember what I put before, 10, 104, 20, 3, 65, zero, zero. I think I have one more here than I had before. Let's do uh, 32. All right, so there's a, a bunch of numbers stored in these memory devices. So somebody had the idea, if I can make a device that can store numbers, can I make a device that manipulates those numbers and does something to them? And that's the idea of a processor. So over here, I'm gonna draw another box, which is really just another circuit. I'm gonna label it CPU for central processing unit. And then if this is gonna access these, it needs a way to connect to them. So I'm gonna add, uh, connection from the processing device to the memory device like that. And then I'm going to add like a little access so that that device can get access to the memory contents. So you can think of those as kind of little gates or little doors that all uh, can access the contents of those memory devices. Now the processor itself is really a simplistic thing and it actually has its own little memory devices inside of it. So it can temporarily pick up numbers and do operations on them and then stick the, the contents back into there. So I'm going to go ahead and label these. Uh, we're just going to call them like, we could call them, think of them like hands. So this is like the processor's ability to grab a number and hold it in its hand. Uh, and we'll put a couple of them in there. We call it left and right or we could call them like A B. We'll just call them A and B for right now. But the idea here is what we have in front of us now is essentially a computer system. We have a processor, we have a memory, we have a thing that connects the processor to the memory, and then we have this little storage inside of the processor where it can store things. So uh, looking at that concept, let's go and label these uh, parts here. So this is the processor. This is obviously the memory. We've already kind of labeled that. But this thing here that connects them, you can think of this as like the wires that are on a motherboard uh, or it's sometimes called the system bus or system buses sometimes. But this is really just wires that connect the CPU to the memory. And then these things that are inside of the processor are what we would call the processor's registers. And registers are really just specialized memory locations that are inside the processor itself. And they really work very similarly to the memory out here. So now notice that we have this uh, 
computer system. It's a relatively simple thing. We just drew a little block diagram of it. And this is exactly how a computer system really works. And uh, this is really important to understand because it shows how simplistic it is. And we're going to dig a little bit deeper into this here in a second. But it also shows that there's nothing magical. There's no like magic brain in here. There's just this CPU. It can fetch numbers out of memory. It can pull them into a register. It can perform a simple operation on them, like adding one to another to get a result or subtracting a number from another to get a result. And then it can store them back in the memory. And that's really it. That's all it does. And if you con contrast this to uh, a, a diagram that I've seen in several books and had in several programming classes where they're always like how the computer works, that nobody really has ever uh, had ever shown me this picture. I kind of figured this out uh, on my own. And once I figured this out, it was incredibly empowering because it shows this is exactly how I could take a, a part of a computer. We could find the memory. We could find the processor. We could find the wires that carry the information from the processor to the memory. And inside of the processor itself, there are these registers that are part of the processor chip itself that are storing the data. And you could actually, if you could watch what's going across these wires, you could see things coming out of memory, going into a register, being manipulated by the processor, and then things coming out of the processor going back into memory. And it's re really a simple process. But if the those classes that I had, so I'm going to label this side kind of how a computer really works. And the cool thing is that every one of them works the same way. So if you have a computer system like a, a laptop or a PC or a high-end gaming computer, it works like this. It has memory. It's got a processor. It's got the uh, processor connected to the memory with these buses so it can get data out of the memory, can do things with it. And the processor has some specialized circuitry inside of it that allows it to do simple uh, arithmetic operations like add, subtract, multiply, divide. And then it has the ability to have other instructions that move things from memory to the registers and move things from the registers back to memory. So relatively uh, simple to understand, and that includes any computer system that you might run into, uh, including something like uh, the processor that's in a smartphone, uh, the processor that's in uh, your security system at home, the processor that's in your uh, key fob that uh, allows you to unlock and lock your car door remotely, the processor that's in the engine of your car, the one that's in your gaming computer, all of them follow this kind of same thing. Now, if you contrast that with what you see in some programming textbooks where they're like, how the computer works, how the computer works, sometimes you would uh, see a diagram that looks like this, that there'd be this uh, block like that, it'd be a block like this, there's an arrow, another arrow, and another block over here. And so here you'd have, this would be labeled like input, this would be labeled uh, processor or processing, and then this would be labeled output. And then sometimes there's like this bonus version of the diagram that has a little bit more detail where they put something like this that says like memory. Now, this is definitely kind of how it works at a conceptual level that it takes information in, passes it across uh, to the processor which does stuff to it, and then maybe stores some of it in memory, and then eventually produces some sort of output. But this is like a useless diagram, because this is not how the computer really works. I can't really open it up and have it have this make any sense. And you could actually ha do this for anything. You could say, like, well, how does a uh, pick an animal? How does a goat work? Well, you feed things into it. It does goat stuff inside of here, and then it produces output. So you feed grass in, goat processing equipment, and then produces output. And so, but this that doesn't help you uh, be a veterinarian and operate on goats or uh, understand their physiology because everything works like that. How does uh, I don't know? Let's uh, pick something else. Uh, how does a, a a car work? You want to be a mechanic. How's a car work? Well. You put gasoline in, and it's got some engine-y, motor -y things, 
and then you it moves. So put gas in, makes motion. Now let's take it apart and figure out how it works. So this is really a useless diagram, but this one here, this is really how the computer system works. The, the, in a really specific way that you could open your computer and find the memory and you could find the wires that connect the memory to the motherboard via the system buses and you could see trace those wires to where they went to the CPU and if you could open up the CPU and look at the gate level on that you could find the registers in there that are holding the numbers that come out of here when they go over there. Now there's still some mystery to this that we haven't solved. For example notice that in this uh, if we go back to the our original thing over here, the CPU, the uh, memory are there. But what about the mouse and the keyboard and the graphics card and the uh, monitor and the hard drive and all that stuff? Notice those aren't shown in this diagram. We only have memory and CPU and system buses, which actually didn't even show up on here. Although if we had added to this list and put motherboard on the list, uh, that is really kind of where these things, these things live. But the idea, the conceptual idea of this is exactly how it works. So I'm going to go and number this as page two. And let's go on to page three. Now, page three, what we're going to do there is I'm going to add those other details to our diagram, so to our conceptual diagram. So let's draw that uh, picture again. Okay, so drawing that picture again. Here's memory. Here's our memory boxes. And there's just a collection of these that are all storing numbers. And then here's our CPU. And inside the CPU, it's got some little memory locations that can store things temporarily, which we called A and B before. And then we had our system buses that connected all that. And I think I did those in this blue color. So let me just continue. That. And then each of these memory boxes had like a little gate on it or a door that you can think of it as opening up to get access to those numbers. So this is memory. And then there are numbers stored inside there. And before we had those numbers, they're zero. Just for continuity, I'll keep those same numbers. 104, uh, 23, 65, 0, 0, 32. And I think I added one more this time. Uh, let's make it 42. All right, so there's my numbers stored in memory. There's my CPU. But we have some other devices uh, that we need to add to this. And those other devices would be things like the graphics card and a monitor, a keyboard, a mouse. And so I, the question is, how do those things connect to the system? So if we want to add those additional components to this, how do they connect to it? So for example, let's say over here we have uh, a keyboard. So there's my keyboard. It's kind of a badly drawn keyboard. But how does that connect to this system? And over here, maybe we have uh, a graphics card. GPU. And then that connects to the monitor. Here's a monitor. You know that the monitor plugs into the graphics card, so that we'll just show it drawn that way. So that we have a monitor or a keyboard. Maybe we add a mouse to this. A little scroll wheel in the middle. Wire that comes out of it. So the question is, how do those other things uh, connect to the computer system? We, we could add other peripherals too, like a hard drive. HDD, hard disk drive. How does that connect to that? System. So the idea here is that really we don't have a whole lot of choices for where to connect this to. So the question is, do those connect directly to the processor? And the answer there is the processor is a relatively simple piece of equipment that can fetch things from memory, 
into its registers and then perform some simple operation on it. And those simple operations are, there's not like a read mouse operation in there. There's not like a, a store to hard drive operation in the processor. It doesn't know any of that. It doesn't know how to put something on the screen. The CPU just is really simple. In fact, the instructions that the CPU can perform are simple. So the CPU has circuitry inside it that can do just simple operations. And those simple operations would be things like add, subtract, let's make this a bullet list, multiply, divide. So really simple things like that. There's a couple other ones we could add here. Obviously move, moving things from memory to the registers, moving things from the registers to memory. And then we might have like be able to compare two things to see which one's bigger, which one's less. And notice I use these like three letter uh, versions of each of those words. So addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, uh, move. Uh, some processors consider that like load and store, but move kind of covers both those because you can move things from memory to registers, from registers back to memory. And then compare, take two things in two different registers and see which one's bigger or smaller or are they equal. So these simple operations that we have here are really all that the processor knows how to do. Now, there might be multiple variants of these uh, operations, these simple ones. Uh, for example, move, there might be a move from memory to register A. There might be a different instruction that's moved from memory to register B. There might be an instruction that's moved from register B to A or A to B. Uh, there's different compares, compare A with B, compare A with something that you pulled from memory and so forth. But all of the operations that the CPU does are just simple things like this. There's no super uh, complicated kind of brain operations going on. It's just these really simple things that we could do ourselves. But the question is, how do these peripherals connect to this system? Because if this is all that the processor can do, we can't have a GPU wire that goes to the processor, a keyboard wire that goes to the processor. And so really, if this is all a computer system is, there's only really one other choice. And that is that these devices actually map directly into some of these specialized uh, forms of these memory boxes. So there's special memory boxes that show up in memory, just like normal memory, but they're connected to some sort of hardware. So the idea is we have something that looks like that. So when I press a key on the keyboard, let me do it with this hand so you can see, when I press a key on that keyboard, it just opens up that box and changes the number in that memory location. So if the CPU wants to know what key was pressed, and do something with that, it has to go to that box, the address where the keyboard is stored, that specific box, and pull out the number that's in there, and that will tell it what key was pressed. And if it wants to make something show up on the screen, it opens the box or boxes that are connected to the GPU, and it puts some numbers in there, and that makes something like a pixel or a dot change color on the screen when that changes. Or it might make a character or a letter show up on the screen uh, when that is put into there. So the idea here uh, is pretty straightforward that this is how every computer system works. No matter how simple, no matter how complex, uh, they all work like this. So if you have that key fob uh, for your uh, car, you press the button. That pushing that button changes something in memory that the processor in that key fob can see. The processor wakes up, looks at that, says, oh, it was the unlock button and it would put a message into a wireless transmitter that's connected to memory, put a message into that memory that makes that wireless transmitter send the thing to your car. And your car, it has a receiver that is connected to a computer system like this, that when the receiver receives that, it puts numbers into memory, the receiver receives that, and if it's the right code, uh, it says unlock the doors, and it sends something to another memory location that's interfaced to the door locks, it pops them open. So really simple, and every computer system, no matter how small or how complicated, follows some version of this uh, uh, setup. So relatively um, simple, useful, easy to understand. Now there are still some mysteries here that we haven't gotten to that we'll get to later. Uh, for example, 
how does the CPU know what instructions to do? Where does it get those from? Uh, another question that you might ask would be, well, if this can only store numbers, how do we have things that show up on our screen like letters and characters and uh, pictures and images and sounds? How do we have those if the only thing the memory can store is numbers? So the CPU can only perform these simple operations. The memory here can only store numbers. And there's a further restriction on those numbers uh, that there's some other questions here that we're going to answer as well, but the numbers that each cell, that's supposed to say range, each cell, cell can only store a number in the range 0 through 255. And that's an inclusive range. So you could store 0, you could store 1, you can store 2, you can go up to 255 in each cell. So here's a couple questions to ponder. Uh, we'll take a quick break and then we'll come back and we'll answer those uh, questions. So here's uh, some questions. And that probably didn't make sense. I probably should put a colon there instead of a question mark because that's questions. Which if you do have questions, feel free to send those along to me. But the questions that I want you to ponder right now are uh, kind of the following. Where does the program come from? In other words, to tell the CPU what to do, something has to tell it where to move things from and where to move things to and which operation you want to perform. Where does that come from? So where does that program come from? All right, so that's the first question. The second question is, why the 0 to 255 range? Why is that the range uh, of possible numbers? I mean, why, why not 0 to 100? Why not 0 to uh, 200? Why is it 0 to 255? It seems like a strange number to choose from. And then the next question is, what happens when we want to store other things? Like, uh, like text like images, like sounds, all important uh, to games. How do we store those if these memory boxes can only store numbers? And then the final question I'm going to put up here is like, what about bigger numbers? So bigger numbers meaning like a million. What if I want to store a million? That's clearly bigger than 255. Or what if I want to store smaller numbers like 0 .001? That I can't do here because even though that's bigger than zero, this is whole numbers in this range. So how do we do that? So what we're going to do is we'll go ahead and pause the video here, uh, and then we're going to come back and we're going to answer some of these questions. Where does the program come from? Why the 0 to 255 range? What about storing other things like text, images, sounds? And then what about bigger numbers or fractional numbers uh, or negative numbers? How do we store those? And so, but there's, there's a really cool and really powerful thing about understanding that this is how every computer system works. And a, a couple things before we take our break is to note are number one, the processor doesn't know what it's doing, it has no understanding whatsoever. It just has a program that says, fetch a number out of this box and then do this operation on it. And based on that operation, it goes to the next instruction, which would then maybe store that number in some other box or fetch another number from another box and do a simple operation. So the notion of, uh, like, like I've heard a lot of times that the CPU is kind of like the brain of the computer, but it's not really a 
brain at all. It's just a, a dumb contraption that takes uh, or carries out the action of the program instruction that it had pulled into uh, or that told it what to do. We'll talk about where that program comes from. But the idea is really simple, that it's just uh, take carrying out an operation that it was told to do. In fact, it's not really much of a brain at all. It's not thinking. It's not pondering. It's not uh, imagining things. It's not uh, making and any decisions it's making are just it's based on this deterministic kind of things like comparison. Compare this with that. If this one's bigger, take this action. If this one's smaller, take this other action. Take this number and add it to that one and take the result and then move it back into memory into this other place. Take the key from the keyboard, load it into a register, compare it to see if it's the right key, if it's the A key, then pull in this other number from memory and add to it to move the character to the left when you press the A, and then stick that back into memory somewhere else and then pull that out of there and change the thing that's in the GPU to make the picture on the screen change. But notice this thing knows absolutely nothing. So the idea of a computer as this like magical thinking device with a brain inside of it is really completely wrong. Now, don't get me wrong that this is still a really powerful thing that can do intelligence, uh, intelligent things, but the intelligence isn't in the hardware. It's in how we put together these simple instructions to do really cool stuff. That's where the magic comes in. Uh, and that's what we're going to be doing in this class. Now, we're not going to be programming in this low-level language. We're going to use something that's a little bit simpler for our brains to uh, comprehend and for us to understand. But the uh, idea here of the computer being really simple can help us uh, with our understanding later on. So I'm going to go ahead and pause it here. When we come back from our little break, uh, we're going to add to this. And I'm going to add some things to this that kind of continue to... Uh, to flesh out this uh, thing and answer these questions. That's pretty cool. I move my hand fast. My fingers work. All right. Anyway, let's stop that. Uh, I'll pause here. Uh, we'll continue, and then I'm going to answer some of these questions.